Please state your name for the record. Robert Rymus. And have you been called here to testify as Jack Kowalski's brother? Yes, sir, I have. Are you older or younger than Mr. Kowalski? Younger. By how many years? About five and a half years. Where'd you grow up? In Chicago. How many kids were in the Kowalski family? Um, well, our extended family. My mother had eight children. Boys, um, girls? Six boys, two girls. Um, but we, we always had more in the house. We always had a cousin or um, we had a foster child at one point. So um, big, big loving family. <laughs> and you went to high school in Chicago? Yes, sir, I did. And so Jack would have graduated well ahead of you. Yes. And what did he go to work doing? Um, during high school, we had a fire cadet program through the fire department junior and senior year. Um, Jack did that and got into the fire service. Um, and I eventually did the same thing. Um, I worked as a volunteer up there. He went on in his life to eventually get hired full time and I, I took a different career path. What was your career path? Um, I've had several, but I, I went into law enforcement instead of firefighting um, at that time. And where were you in law enforcement? Up in Pinellas County, um, Tarpon Springs, Florida. So you ended up from Chicago down here in Florida on law enforcement? Yes. And what roles were you serving in, in your law enforcement career? I worked as a patrol officer for under a year until I made detective and then I worked property crimes for just under a year again and then I went into crimes against persons um, which is all the all the nasty stuff the sex abuse the child abuse the homicide um, and the crimes against persons so in those five years you learned how to spot child abuse yes sir I did and why, after five years, did your law enforcement career end? Um, burnout, really. Um, you know, you do that job and you're, you're professional and you go to work every day. And um, I definitely left on good terms. But you go to work every day and then you do what you're supposed to do. But then you find yourself at home in the shower crying at night. And uh, it, it takes a toll on you. And um, I had an offer at the time to go work for another company. And um, it was actually a little more money. And I, I decided that I was, I was going to make that move. And after you resigned from the force, did you leave Florida? Um, yes, eventually. Um, a short, I went to work for that other company. And then in, I believe, 1997, I left Florida after my son was born. And where'd you go? Um, up to Indiana. And what kind of work did you do up in Indiana? Um, we went to Indiana mainly because I had two stepchildren and, and a newborn son. And my wife um, had family up in Indiana, lived out in the country, and we decided that would be a better place to raise the children. Um, so we went up there and I worked um, as a, a butcher, um, which is something I've done since I was young on the side. I've always worked in butcher shops and then also um, auto marine and airplane upholstery work, um, which is what my father and uncles all did. Um, so I've always done that on the side as well. So at, at this point in your life, you're living in Indiana. Is Jack still in Chicago at this point? Yes. And it was during this period that Jack met Beata? Yes. And living in Indiana, how far away were you from the Chicago area? Um, we're in Fort Wayne, so just a couple hours, about two hour drive. So you had opportunity to regularly meet and interact with Jack and Beata together? Yes, because my mother was still in Chicago. And my, I had a couple brothers up there. Um, so we, we frequently <coughs> visited. What was your first impression of Beata? I loved her. Um, she's, she's just, uh, 
she was just uh, you know a, a wonderful person she I respected her because she was very to the point um, she didn't hold any punches she told you how she was feeling um, but she was just just a loving sweet person um, loved to teach me how to make pierogies and you know she, she was a great person how would you describe their relationship? Beautiful. Um, we, you know, coming from a big family, my mom raised us, and uh, we were always taught to love each other and respect each other and respect everybody. And, you know, that's why we got into careers like we did, you know, firefighting and law enforcement, because we help each other and we help other people. And, um, Beata was that same way, and um, my wife is a nurse, and those are the people we've always chose to surround ourselves with, are people like us, and um, I'm sorry, I don't even remember what your original question was. That's right. So, your wife was a nurse and Beata was a nurse? Yes. So you and Jack had that in common? Yes. Were you there for their wedding, Jack and Beata? Yes, I was their best man. And where was that? That was in Illinois. In Chicago? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Do you recall what year? Oh, now you're really going to tug at me here. Um, no, I don't recall exactly what year. I think it was like 2004, 2003. <clears throat> um, were you there when uh, Maya was born or, or around that time? Not there when she was born, but, you know, shortly afterwards, obviously, to visit. Um, How did Beata strike you as a new mom? Just, you know, she was holding the light of her life in her hands every time you saw her. Um, just as proud as any mother could be. And then Kyle came, what, two years later? Mm-hmm. And you're still living in Indiana as um, Kyle and Maya are growing up in Chicago? Yes. How often would you see them if, on a yearly basis, if you had um, to estimate? You know, obviously all the holidays and um, birthdays and things like that, we'd get together. So probably, you know, at least a half dozen to a dozen times a year. And how would you describe Jack and Beata together as parents when Kyle and Maya were young in Chicago? Just a, a great couple. Um, Jack's, Jack's my best friend. He uh, he found the light of his life and he was happy and they they were great together. Um, so as he was approaching retirement from the fire department, did he talk to you about a desire to move to Florida? Mm -hmm. And he beat you back to Florida. Is that right? Yeah, he did. <clears throat> uh, so they moved to Florida mm -hmm. in around 2014. You, you were still doing work in Indiana in the yes. upholstery business, uh, aircraft upholstery business at that yes. point? Was there a particular job that brought you down to Florida around that time? Yeah, I had friends in Florida um, in the aviation business and a friend of mine who managed um, business jets for people. So. If somebody has a business jet, they'll they'll typically hire a management company to take care of all the FAA paperwork and that kind of thing and maintenance. And um, he called me and he says, we have this jet that we manage that needs a complete upholstery job in it. And he says, I'd like you to bid on it. Um, and I, I was a little shocked at first. I said, I don't live down there. And he said, bid on it. He says, it's, it's good money. So... I bid on the job and it was worth my while to go down there and do the job. So I set up a trailer with sewing machines and everything and went down there and, and did the job. And um, that started my move to Florida uh, because it was successful. Where was that work? Which airport? In Lakeland, Florida. And were you living in Lakeland or were you living in Venice at that time? At that time, um, I had brought, we had a big motor home, so I, had brought, I have another brother who lives in Lakeland, so 
I brought the motorhome down. I was actually living in the motorhome while I was working at his, the motorhome was at his house. And did Kyle and Maya have opportunity to come over and see you in your aviation business in Lakeland? Yes, um, especially Kyle. What do you Kyle, remember about that? Kyle loved to fly. I flew back and forth every day. Uh, well, at that time, I didn't have my plane in the early, early stages. Um, but Kyle loved airplanes, and he would come out and help me. Um, I was building a new shop, and he came and helped me build all the tables to put the sewing machines in. And um, you know, we spent a lot of time together. Um, just a just a great, happy little kid. What, what's he call you, by the way? What's Kyle call you? Uncle Bob. Uncle Bob. Did Maya fly with you as well? Uh, yes, eventually, yeah. She wasn't as big of a fan as Kyle. No, I think she had a good time. Okay. The the job you mentioned that brought you down to Florida, who was the client or the customer for that job? Um, the owner of the jet, um, I remember his first name was Eduardo. They were, they owned some banks in Mexico, but the pilot is who I dealt with and his name was Abraham. And I'm gonna fast forward here for a moment in the timeline. Um, Cause you're doing this work in, in the poultry business for the pilot Abraham in 2014, 2015. Mm -hmm. And Fast, just for a moment, just to fast forward a couple of years, in late 2015, Maya went down to Mexico for treatment. You were aware of that? Yes. And can you tell the jury what the connection was there with Abraham and, and Maya's treatment in Mexico? Abraham and his family lived in Monterey, Mexico, which is where the hospital was that, that they were going to. Um, he immediately when I told him the story of what was going on, he, he immediately said, put me in touch with them and I, I will take care of everything when they get to Mexico. Um, Abraham and his family met them at the hospital and um, they, they were there for him the whole time. Anything they needed in Mexico. Um, gave Maya a big stuffed animal bear um, Do you recall if uh, Maya, Jack, Beata were able to bring that bear back to Florida with them? <laughs> no, that's kind of a funny story because the, you know, it was this big, real soft, big teddy bear, and it was too big for them to bring back on the commercial flight. So Abraham had to bring the plane back to me to finish things up, and he put the bear in the nose cone of the jet in a little storage compartment and flew the bear back up to Lakeland, Florida. And uh, Jack and Maya came out and met us at the airport there. And we wheeled Maya up to the plane and opened the nose cone and the bear just kinda, kinda fell out for her. It, it was just a, a cute moment and a, you know, a, a great thing for the guy to do. Your Honor, I'd like to show Mr. Ryan is uh, what's been admitted as Exhibit 2530-020. May we publish? Yes, you may. <laughs> yep, that's Maya getting her teddy bear, and that's Abraham. So the gentleman there handing her the teddy bear is Abraham? Yes. And Maya in the wheelchair? Yes. Is that his plane right there in the background? Yes, with the hatch open on the right. What kind of plane was it, do you remember? It was a Cessna um, Citation, or I'm sorry, a Cessna Mustang. And this photo is uh, January 30th, 2016. Does that sound right? Yes. So this was after her ketamine treatment in Mexico. Yes. A month or two after. All right. That's good, thank you. All right, so I fast forward there to show the teddy bear coming back. Let's, let's back it up a little bit. 
you relocate to Florida initially for this job in 2014, 2015. Did there come a time when you moved to Venice permanently? Yeah, we, um, I think, you know, once I started my second job, my wife and I, my wife worked in a surgery center up in Indiana, and we both immediately started talking about making a move to Florida. Um, so we actually found a house in Jack's little circle. Um, the neighborhood he lives in, it's really a unique neighborhood because all of the neighbors in there know each other and they all hang out together. And um, so we, we wanted that neighborhood and there was one house for sale and we came down to look at it and um, the night before we got there, it went under contract. So we we're a little heartbroken, but they were starting a new subdivision right across the street. And we ended up buying a spec home right inside the gate. So we were still probably less than a quarter mile from Jack, uh, right across the street. So Jack couldn't get away from you? No, I, I found him. And so this was, uh, if I'm tracking, is it, uh, early 2016 when you bought that house? Yes. And by this point, um, based on your observations, was Maya in pain? After the Mexico, um, she was doing much better. She was greatly improving. Um, you had seen her. You had seen her before the Mexico yeah, trip. Yeah, because I I was coming down, you know, doing the job doing the jobs on the airplanes. Um, and even though I was in Lakeland, I would come over and visit. And, you know, we would we would get together. Um, but after after Mexico, there was definite improvement. Um, she was working hard to get better. As um, as 2016 went on, summer it's almost the school year. Um, did her pain return? Yeah. What what can you tell the jury about that? Um, I I read Maya's face a lot, um, and you know you can tell when somebody's in pain. Um, I have a lot of pain and neurological issues myself, and there was a day that stands out, and I, I think it was probably probably like September of sixteen where we were at Jack's house and the kids from the neighborhood and there may have been a niece or nephew there and Kyle and Maya and everybody was in the pool and having a good time and Maya was on a floaty and I was just sitting there with my feet in the pool after a while watching the kids and I could see as time went on she was she was hurting more and more and she's she's a lot like her mom she she's a tough girl and she tried she wanted to stay in the pool with the kids so she tried to fight through that and and tried to stay in the pool as long as she could but it finally got to the point where she couldn't take it anymore and she floated over to me and she said uncle bobby i need to get out of the pool she says i hurt real bad so i picked her up and i carried her in the house Was it shortly after that that she went to Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital? Yeah, I'm not sure of the exact date, but yes. <clears throat> Did you ever accompany Maya or Jack or Beata to any of her treatments? No, well, unfortunately I wasn't allowed to. Um, so she goes into Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital um, how did you first learn that she wasn't going to be coming home soon? Jack and I talked every day, and uh, he called me and told me, he says, they took Maya. And I said, what do you mean they took Maya? And he says, they took custody of Maya, they took her away from us. And me, like him, and everybody else, like Maya, like Beata, everybody was in shock not understanding what just happened. 
How, how would you describe your brother's reaction knowing that she couldn't come home? Fear, which is something I've never seen on Jack's face before. Um, I've seen him do stuff on the fire department that most people in this world would never try, dangling off of water towers and stuff. And uh, I've never seen fear on his face, but it was, it was just, he was scared. For the first time I saw my brother really, truly scared. Same question, what about Piata? how'd she react? Angry. Um, Jack and I, Jack and Viata were a little different in that respect where Viata was, like I said, she would tell you how she feels and Jack was kind of the opposite of that where he, I mean, he would tell you how he feels, but just a different reaction where Viata was mad and, and scared and you know, but definitely angry. <clears throat> what about what about uh, your nephew Kyle? He was just a little boy. He was devastated. You know, his sis and they were close. They, you know, a lot of little kids don't don't play together. They they were in that pool all the time. They did everything together. And so, you know, at eight, eight years old, I think he was at the time, he lost his best friend. Um, I don't know the words, shock, scared, just unbelievable. And you were aware at this point that the accusations by the hospital were that uh, Beata had this condition and was a child abuser? Yes. Drawing off of your experience as a detective with child abuse investigations, had you ever seen any signs of child abuse in the Kowalski home? Yeah. Jack Kowalski. Yeah, like Sustained. When Maya was in the hospital, did you submit your name for a background check so you could be a supervised visitor at the hospital? Yes, I did. <clears throat> was your background check approved? Yes. Were you allowed to visit? No, I was not. <clears throat> Did the hospital ever give you a reason why? Objection. I'm going to overrule that question. Um, I'm sorry, what was the question? Did the hospital ever give you a reason why you weren't allowed to visit? They didn't think it was a good idea. Objection, Your Honor. Can we approach?
Okay, the, the objection is sustained. Members of the jury, that last question and answer, you're going to disregard it. How long was Maya in the hospital? I honestly don't recall. I, several months. Did you ever have the opportunity to visit her in the hospital? No, I did not. Who were you getting reports from during that time about Maya's condition? Mostly Jack. <clears throat> during the three or so months that Maya was in the hospital, how was Beata doing? She was struggling. Um, She was researching a lot about the disease, um, just struggling trying to trying to figure out how to get her baby home. How was your brother doing? Trying to hold the family together. Um, in such an ugly situation, he just he tried to be the strong, strong one and keep Kyle going and keep Beata on track and just, he, he was struggling. January 8th, 2017, does that date have any significance to you? Yeah, it's my 50th birthday. Can you describe how you woke up that morning? Jack, Jack called me and said Beata just hung herself and uh, you need to get over here right away. Did, so you, I, did you rush over? To yes, immediately. I told my wife Beata hung herself and I'm going to Jack's and I took off across the street. And you went into the house? Yes. Did you go in through the front door or the garage? Front door. Where was, where was Kyle? Kyle was near the laundry room door, which is just to the right of the front door. And he was trying to get into the garage. Um, Jack was yelling, Kyle, no, you can't go in there. He was trying to keep him back. Um, can, I, can I stop you there? Mm -hmm. Your Honor, we'd like to, at this point, publish 2615 and allow the jury the opportunity to listen. Is it, is it in evidence? It is, Your Honor. You may. Yes. Number 8, 2017, set an hour, 57 minutes and 38 seconds, Sam. Uh, What's the address? What city are you in? Venice. Closest road is Lee Road. In Venice. Is there a name to the neighborhood? Kyle. What's the phone number that you call that you're calling from? Uh, I'll give you my cell. Tell me exactly what happened. Uh, she hung herself in the garage. <laughs> no. Stay on the line. Are you with her now? Uh, well, I'm in. I, yeah, I'm in the garage. How old is she? Forty-two. <laughs> is she awake? I just no, have to she, verify. She's stiff. She's stiff. She's stiff. Oh my God. <laughs> no, Kyle, you can't go in there. Okay, tell me why she looks like she's dead. No, she's. No, I'm, I'm a, de a retired deputy fire chief. I know she is. <laughs> Do you think she's beyond any help? Uh, beyond, beyond, yes. Rigamore. I'm sure she's. 
She's really okay. Sick. I I'm sending the this. I'm sending the fire. The I'm sending someone to assist you. Please leave everything as you found it. I'm Is there anything enough. we can do for you? Okay, just please get somebody here. They're on their way. Uh, I'm gonna get my. I'm gonna bring my son to my neighbor, sir. Call my neighbor. Okay. Can you tell me the address there one more time? To okay, they're on their way. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye bye. What'd you do with Kyle when you got there? I, I grabbed Kyle and I asked Jack if he could call the fire department and um, just told him I'm getting Kyle out of here. And I, I scooped up Kyle and he's just a skinny little boy and I grabbed him and took him home and we sat in a chair in my living room for probably six or eight hours crying. Did you see Jack the rest of that day? Oh, I'm sure I did when I brought Kyle back or I, I don't recall honestly. Maya was still at Johns Hopkins Alterns Hospital? Yes. How long was it after that morning that Maya came home from the hospital? Not long at all. I, I don't remember how many days, but it was it was pretty quick. <coughs> so uh, emotionally, we can all guess how Maya was at that point. Yeah. How was she physically when she came home out of the hospital? She was horrible, horrible. She had been getting so much better, and just to see her going from, you know, in, improving every day to coming home, and her feet were all turned in where her toes were pointing at each other. Um, again, just looking at her face, the amount of pain in that child. I think it was worse than I had ever seen at that point. So <clears throat> stepping back and comparing Maya physically to where she was in late September, early October of 2016 before she went in the hospital. In January 2017 when she comes out of the hospital, was she better or worse? She was far worse coming out of the hospital. What'd you, um, what'd you do to support your brother in the next days and weeks? I closed my shop down and I, I stayed with him. I, th I think I closed my shop probably for a couple months. And I stayed with him every day and helped him with paperwork, cleaning the house, cooking meals, whatever, whatever it took. Just anything, just to be there for them. As um, the Kowalskis grappled with their new life, did you have the opportunity to observe Maya physically rehabilitate herself? <laughs> yeah, and. Um, She was obvious, she lost her mother, so she was obviously emotionally in a different place. But from a physical standpoint, she's just she's a lot like a mother. She was just very determined and she was gonna work hard and she wanted out of that wheelchair and she wanted to walk again. And she worked out constantly through the pain. Uh, I would see her on the, 
on the floor in front of her wheelchair doing exercises um, with tears coming out of her eyes, but she would fight right through it. <laughs> and then uh, one day, after she had finally gotten up on crutches, one day I come over and she's loading up her book bag not to go to school, but she's putting all kinds of books in her book bag and she put it on her back just to walk down the street to her friend's Riley's house on her crutches. And she wanted that extra weight on her back for exercise and the practice so she can go back to school. She's, she's a tough kid. And I love you, Maya. How about your nephew, Kyle? How'd he do in the six months, year after he lost his mother? Very introverted. Um, I mean, how does any kid do knowing that they're never going to see their mother again? He, he, he struggled. He um, was very quiet, stayed in his room, didn't interact much with anybody. And um, I think it was, you know, he was trying to grieve internally. And then he eventually, long term, getting to the point where he is now, um, he fishes. That's his outlet. outlet. He likes to fish. Um, it's his place to get away, I think. Maya immersed herself in her school books when she got back to school, and Kyle immersed himself in fishing. <laughs> um, but. And, and Jack immersed himself in helping people again. Um, I, I think he, he just, like I said, eventually turned to fishing to have his quiet time and to deal with this. And my last question, um, your brother Jack, how has, how has he changed since losing Beata? He's changed the most. And uh, he hides it the most. He's not as funny as he used to be. Um, he's he's a dad and a mom, and he's the best father I've ever known. Um, he's always been the best father I've ever known. But taking on the role of being a mother as well for those children. There's nobody in this world that could have done it better. He will do anything for his children. Um, he, again, needed some kind of an outlet. And um, I kind of did too with the pain issues I was going through. Um, so I <laughs> I think for my last five years living in Florida, I saw Jack more than my wife, literally, <laughs> because we would get up every morning and go get coffee at Wawa and sit down and have a sandwich and talk to a couple of vets that would sit out there every morning and, you know, we'd kind of hang out with them. And then uh, we would go help neighbors, uh, whether it be painting baseboards in their house or painting their house or we, we kept busy helping people because um, that's what we were always sought to do but he's changed in the sense of <laughs> I keep going back to humor thinking about this um, not that you're not funny anymore <laughs> um, he He's a very serious person because he knows, he knows the struggles he has raising two children alone. Um, I'm glad I'm, I was there for him. I'm glad he was there for me. Um, I think we helped each other a lot, but he's, he's different. He's, he's just, he does, probably doesn't socialize as much. I know he doesn't so, socialize as much as he used to. Um, there used to be a lot more gatherings in the neighborhood and everything that there is now and 
he was always a big part of them. Um, that neighborhood kind of became my community as well. Uh, your witness. I just have a couple of questions for you. Okay. I want to bring you back to um, the trip to Mexico. Mm -hmm. With regard to that photograph with the teddy bear and coming back, is it your understanding that that was from the second trip to Mexico when they went back for a booster? I do not recall, honestly, what, what the date was on that. Okay, um, you recall that they did go back to Mexico a second time. Objection. Legal basis. Not facts, on evidence. Overruled. I, I don't recall. Okay, that's fine. Um, and then let's talk about uh, Maya's condition leading up to going to the admission at All Children's in October. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, you would agree, sir, that she was in a significant amount of pain expressed pain prior to that admission, correct? She was in pain, but it was it was greatly getting better. She was she was getting better every day. <clears throat> okay. Are 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 you aware, sir, of all the ketamine treatments that she was getting in the week leading up to that admission? I I knew there were treatments and I don't know at what point I, I learned about ketamine specifically. Sure. Um, Sure. So are you aware that she was going to see Dr. Hannah on 927, 928, 929, 930, October 5th and October 6th for ketamine treatments? No, I, I knew she saw Dr. Hannah. I, I don't know dates of her appointments. Okay. And just briefly, sir, about not being able to see Maya while she was in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Sir, so you're aware that there were various court orders that were entered, or are you aware that there were various court orders that were entered regarding visitation? Um, I'm aware that I was notified that Sir, I, I don't want to have permission. I'm just asking if you're aware of the court orders. Yes or no? That there were court orders that there was no visitation? Regarding visitation. For other people, not for me. Okay, sir. And all of your communications all of your communications with regard to whether or not you could visit Maya were with DCF personnel, correct? The conversations about whether or not I could visit Maya were with DC. So yes or no, sir? We're with I'm, all I'm DCF to personnel. Recall. Please give me a second. That's, sure. This is a long time ago. Um, I can't say all of them, but I know some of them were. Um, I, I don't recall if there were any with anybody that, I, I don't even know who worked for the hospital. I know I did have conversations with people that worked for the state. Yes, sir. Thank you. One minute. Nothing further here. Any redirect? <coughs> Sir, just to confirm, during the three and a half months that I was in the hospital, you submitted your information for a background check. Yes. That background check was approved. Yes. You never had the opportunity to see Maya in the hospital. Correct. Thank you. Anything further? No, Your Honor. Members of the jury, do you all have any questions for this witness? If so, just raise your hand. Seeing no hands, sir, you can go ahead and be excused. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.